Okay, I'm going to begin with a, a prayer that St. Margaret Mary Alacoque composed in the late 1600s. So this was in the 17th century. Uh, does anybody know who St. Margaret Mary Alacoque is? Yes, the Sacred Heart, yes. Uh, this prayer is a consecration to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. God eternally is, is love in his very nature. But get this, God in his eternity and who he is in his infinite nature does not have emotions. He doesn't get angry, he doesn't get sad, he doesn't get happy. He doesn't have emotions. But yet he's perfect and all good and all perfect and all holy and all loving. And isn't that weird to think, if you really think about it, he can't have emotions because this is a creature feature. This is, uh, it has to do with the passions that are created. But God took on a humanity. He took on a created body and a created soul, a rational soul. And so in his humanity, he has emotions. So now we can say God has emotions and God can laugh. And what's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. He wept. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, 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 uh, Jesus wept. And, and so the Sacred Heart is uh, focusing upon how God took upon himself a human heart, and so he loves us, truly loves us as a human being would, but perfectly with the human heart. And so that's what the devotion to the Sacred Heart is, is recognizing God's love for us. And St. Margaret Mary Alacoque is, is very famous because from the time she was 20, she experienced visions of Christ. Christ would appear to her. Uh, but he wouldn't so much give revelations. Uh, but on December the 27th, 1673, uh, he began giving a series of revelations to her. He began telling her things, uh, which were to continue for a year and a half. And of course, uh, as usually happens when this happens. Everybody disbelieves you and everybody thinks you're nuts and they tell you to stop. And, uh, but over time, she continued and uh, theologians looked into what, what she was saying and what was being revealed to her and it was eventually approved by the authorities of the church, the bishops. Uh, in these revelations, Christ informed her that she was his chosen instrument to, to spread devotion to his sacred heart. People at that time needed to know about Jesus' love for them. You know, maybe it was scholastic theology. You know, looking at the little fine points of doctrine, but missing the love that God has for us. Maybe it was that. I don't know. But that's what Jesus wanted to be stressed at that point in time. And so I'm going to pray this, this prayer that she prayed. So let's go ahead and begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I give myself and consecrate to the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, my person and my life, my actions, pains, and sufferings, so that I may be unwilling to make use of any part of my being other than to honor, love, and glorify the sacred heart. This is my unchanging purpose, namely to be all his, and to do all things for the love of him, at the same time renouncing with all my heart whatever is displeasing to him. I therefore take you, O sacred heart, to be the only object of my love, the guardian of my life, my assurance of salvation, the remedy of my weakness and inconstancy, the atonement for all the faults of my life, and my sure refuge at the hour of death. Be then, O heart of goodness, my justification before God the Father, and turn away from me the strokes of his righteous anger. O heart of love, put all my confidence in you, for I fear everything from my own wickedness and frailty, but I hope for all things from your goodness and bounty. Remove from me all that can displease you or resist your holy will. Let your pure love imprint your image so deeply upon my heart that I shall never be able to forget you or to be separated from you. May I obtain from all your loving kindness the grace of having my name written in your heart. For in you I desire to place all my happiness and glory, living and dying in bondage to you. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, 
be present now, and let your Holy Spirit bow all hearts in love and truth today to hear your word and keep your way. Give us the grace to grasp your word that we may do what we have heard. Instruct us through the scriptures, Lord, as we draw near, O God, adored. To God the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit, three in one. To you, O blessed Trinity, be praised throughout eternity. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week was chapter 19, what Jesus did. And this week is what Jesus taught. And the Gospels are so full. They're so huge. They're, they're just filled with so much that it would be impossible for in an hour and a half to go over everything Jesus said and did. Uh, first of all, because it all wasn't written down. <laughs> Because if you look in the end of John's Gospel, John says that there were many things that Jesus did, uh, many miracles that he performed, but if they were all written down, all the books in the world couldn't contain them. Uh, and we only have a, a select number that are recounted for us in the Gospels. And, and even if I were to go through all those, we wouldn't have an hour and a half. So last week, I focused on some of what Jesus did, principally at the beginning of his mystery, his baptism, his temptation in the wilderness, his gathering of the twelve, the wedding at Cana, and the proclamation of the kingdom. And I kind of left off last week with the proclamation of the kingdom. So Jesus did all these things, you know, but now he's starting to preach. He's starting to say things. And we'll notice that when Jesus says things, he teaches, he's not just you know, just teaching. Like, he's not just getting up and just teaching in any old fashion, but he's teaching in a specific way. He's using the Old Testament when he teaches. And his disciples, okay, the 12, the 12 apostles, I guess minus Judas is scary, but even Judas seems to mirror what's going on in the Old Testament. You know, he sells Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Oh my gosh, just like, you know, where, where does that come from? Zechariah? Uh, Judas, just like uh, David's... Uh, uh, friend, who was one of his companions, uh, David, David the king, the Messiah, his, so his friend betrays him, so Judas betrays. So even kind of, you even see in Judas a little bit of uh, alluding to the Old Testament in his actions at least, even though we don't have any of his teaching. Uh, the other apostles uh, taught Paul, who was considered an apostle but not one of the original twelve, he used the Old Testament incredibly. So tonight, we're, again, we're going to be looking at the Old Testament as we look at what Jesus taught. Let's open up our Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. And if you guys have a red letter Bible like I do, where it puts the words of Jesus in red, you'll notice that this is the first bit of red in Mark's Gospel. There's no red uh, anywhere before that, because this is the first thing that Jesus says in Mark's Gospel. What does he say? This is the time of fulfillment. The of fulfillment. Okay, the time of fulfillment. So what's being fulfilled is... Israel's expectations, specifically the Jewish expectations at the time. And these expectations were all the prophetic hopes of the Old Testament. So the, the time of fulfillment is a time when, uh, I'm going to say, the, the prophetic hopes are coming to fulfillment. They're basically these hopes are being answered, these prophetic hopes. And we're going to look at these prophetic hopes in just a moment. So the time of fulfillment is happening. And I mentioned last week that the Old Testament is a story in search of an ending. It's like reading Gone with the Wind, but leaving out you know, the very end, leaving out the climax. It's, it's expecting, it's waiting, hopeful expectation. And according to a Jew today, uh, that expectation is still, we've still been waiting 2,000 years. But according to a Christian, 
that time of fulfillment occurred when Jesus was walking on the earth. That, that time of fulfillment had come. That time of expectation was, was fulfilled. Okay, what's the next, what does he continue to say? The reign of God is at hand, or the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay, reign, kingdom. I'm going to say the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God. And last week, we, we discussed this. What kingdom? What kingdom of God is at hand? The heavenly kingdom. But, but he says, he does say... The, you know, if it is I who drive out demons, then assuredly you know that the kingdom of God is at hand. It is here. It's present. And he says the kingdom of God is among you. By the way, there's a misinterpretation of the New Testament in one passage. I forgot exactly where it is, where some people interpret it as saying the kingdom of God is within you. But that's a misinterpretation of the passage. It's a common misinterpretation of the, of the original uh, it's the kingdom of God is among you. Now, if the kingdom of God is here, it's among us. It's, it's the kingdom of heaven. Heaven, in a certain sense, is here. And it's the kingdom of God. But what kingdom? The Davidic. the Davidic. Right. Because Christ is the son of David. He's born in Bethlehem. He's anointed by a Levite. He's considered the son of the Most High, which Solomon was considered. There are all these Davidic themes. So the kingdom of God is the kingdom that the Israelites have been awaiting. It is. It's just not in the form that they expected. It wasn't, Jesus is not going to rule by military might or political savvy. He's going to rule by priestly sacrifice. Okay, the kingdom of God. And then what, what, what's the next? He finishes it off with what? Reform your lives and believe in the gospel. What translation is that? I have New American. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you have another version of the New There are different versions of the New American. I have New... I have a really old one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm not going <laughs> to... Okay, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent, which means to turn 180 degrees around. It also means, you know, to basically turn away from your sin. Repent and believe... In me, right? Repent and believe what? The gospel. The gospel. The good news. And we get gospel from God's spell, which is Old English, meaning good news. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus just basically pointed to three things from the Old Testament. The prophetic hopes of the prophets... The Davidic kingdom, where they, they're waiting for the descendant of David to arise, and the gospel. Let's go ahead and turn to the Old Testament. Let's turn to, well, before we, before we turn to the prophets, I'm just going to do a, a quick recounting. What happened in 1000 BC? What huge event occurred in 1000 BC? What occurred? There you go. I wrote it up on the board for you. 1000 BC, God enters into a covenant with David because David had rest round about from all of his enemies. So it fulfills Deuteronomy and now he can build a temple for God. And we have the Davidic covenant. But David reigns and then his son Solomon reigns after him. And then when Solomon dies in 930 B.C., what happens with Rehoboam and Jeroboam? Not just Israel, but the kingdom of Israel. The Davidic kingdom divides into north and into south. And the north uh, is composed of ten tribes plus some Levites. So I'm going to put an L here. And the south is two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, with some Levites in the Levitical cities. And then, what ended up happening in 7 
22 B.C. Yeah, the northern kingdom is conquered and exiled by Assyria. And basically, the... The, major, the, the majority of the people were exiled to foreign lands and were intermixed among the people and became Gentiles. And some were left in the land to intermarry among pagans who were brought into the land, and so they're known as Samaritans. Samaritans. And then, so the, 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 the northern kingdom is basically history. And, and why was the northern history uh, sent into exile? It was because they just couldn't defend themselves against Sennacherib, the Assyrian emperor, or was there a deeper reason? They were they wanted to yeah, which was the three-letter word, sin. sin. Sin is what caused this. And so we're going to look at, you know, so when Jesus says repent, you know, this is going to be turning away from sin. Okay, and then what happened later on in 586 B.C.? Yeah, the southern kingdom is conquered, destroyed, and exiled into exile, okay, by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. And then uh, they're basically in captivity for about 70 years, and then they end up returning to the land. Some of them do. They end up returning to the land, and those are who we know as the Jews, because the majority of the returnees are from Judah. And we have a small number from Benjamin. Benjamin was a very small tribe. And we have a small number of Levites. Okay, so they're known as Jews. And before the book of Ezra in the Bible, which talks about this return, you don't find the word Jews referring to all the people. Uh, there are Judahites, and they're just, you know, of that specific tribe. Okay, so... The prophets prophesy that sin, you know, caused, the, first of all, caused the divide, you know, in 930, caused the conquering and exile of the northern kingdom. Sin caused the conquering and the exile of the southern kingdom. Okay, let's go ahead and turn to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23. And again, you're going to see some overlap with the lessons that we did last semester or in the fall in the Old Testament. It's a good thing. Yes, repetition is good. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 8. Jeremiah 23, 1 through 8. And here's a sample appetizer of the prophets. Woe to the shepherds who mislead and scatter the flock of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, against the shepherds who shepherd my people. You have scattered my sheep and driven them away. You have not cared for them, but I will take to care to punish your evil deeds. I myself, this is Yahweh speaking, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock from all the lands to which I have driven them and to bring them back to their meadow. There they shall increase and multiply. I will appoint shepherds for them who will shepherd them. I will appoint shepherds, plural, for them who will shepherd them, so that they need no longer fear and tremble, and none shall be missing, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous shoot to David. As king, he shall reign and govern wisely, and he shall do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah shall be saved. Israel shall dwell in security. This is the name they give him, the Lord our justice. Therefore, the days will come, says the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt, but rather as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of the house of Israel up from the land of the north. Okay, those are those ten tribes in the north. Because... Babylon was way to the east, not up to the north. Okay, these are the ten tribes. And from all the lands to which I banish them, they shall again live on their own land. Okay, so there's going to be a righteous shoot to David, a shoot, a netzer. 
Okay, that's, this is the, the root word of Nazareth. So this is why Nazareth was a key place where Jesus uh, grew up. And notice it's, it's comparing this taking of God's exiled people, Israel, north and south. He's comparing this, taking them out of exile and bringing them back to the land and reuniting them under the Messiah to the exodus. It says in verse 7, They shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. That's the exodus. So this event is being called, basically, you could call it the new exodus, the exodus again. Instead of coming up from Egypt, they come from all the lands to which they were scattered because of sin. The new exodus. And there's going to be a pointing of shepherds. And I want for you to... Also, well, well, we'll get back to that in a little bit. I'm, I'm going to show you something in Jeremiah 16. Okay, let's turn to Ezekiel 37. And again, we went over this last semester, but we're going to quickly review it again. Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel is uh, right after Jeremiah's Lamentations, then Baruch, and then Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. In Ezekiel 36 and 37... Well, actually, it goes, it goes back even further than that. It goes back to, let's see, your 33. Yeah, you can pretty much go back to 33, 34, 35, 36, 37. It's all one big narrative. So I'm just choosing one small part out of this bigger narrative. And, and if you guys have time, go back and read, you know, all the way going back to Ezekiel 34. Okay, but we're just going to look at Ezekiel 37, verse 15. Thus the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel. Okay, this is Ezekiel 37, 15. Now, son of man, take a single stick and write on it Judah, and those Israelites were associated with him. Then take another stick and write on it Joseph, and all the house of Israel associated with him. Okay, basically the first stick represents the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, Okay, those who are still associated with the tribe of Judah. And then take another stick and write on it, Joseph. Why Joseph? Well, because Joseph's sons, Ephraim, the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, remember Ephraim and Manasseh were Joseph's sons, constitu- they were in the northern kingdom, and they took up the majority of the northern people population-wise. So you could almost call it the house of Joseph, because so many of them were descendants of Joseph. And this goes back to the blessing that uh, Israel gave to his uh, grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. I'm sorry, not Joseph, but Israel. Yeah, Israel gave to his grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Or was it Joseph who gave it, gave the blessing? Was it Israel? He was a grandfather and gave the blessing? Okay, so these two kingdoms he says to take a stick that represents the southern kingdom and a stick that represents the northern kingdom and he's going to do a prophetic action he says verse 17 then join the two sticks together so that they form one stick in your hand when your countrymen ask you will you not tell us what you mean by all this answer them thus says the lord god i will take the stick of joseph which is in the hand of ephraim and of the tribes of Israel associated with him, and I will join to it the stick of Judah, making them a single stick, and they shall be one in my hand. The sticks on which you write, you shall hold up before them to see. So basically this is a prophetic action saying I'm going to reunite this kingdom physically as one people like before. There's going to be a unity. But... If you're, if you're reading this, by this time, you're thinking, guys, uh, there is no northern kingdom. <laughs> Where did it go? I mean, take them from all the lands. How are you gonna, this is going to be really miraculous. Okay. Verse 21. Tell them, thus speaks the Lord God, I will take the Israelites from among the nations to which they have come and gather them from all sides to bring them back to their land. I will make them one nation upon the land in the mountains of Israel. And there shall be one prince for them all. One prince. 
Never again shall they be two nations, and never again shall they be divided into two kingdoms. No longer shall they defile themselves with their idols or abominations and all their transgressions. I will deliver them from all their sins of apostasy. Remember, delivering from sins of apostasy. The, the sins of apostasy is what caused the exile. So there's going to be a forgiveness of sins. It's going to be associated with this restoration. And cleanse them so that they may be my people and I may be their God. Again, that's covenant language. My servant David, this is verse 24, shall be prince over them. So who's the prince that's going to be over them? The son of David, who is the anointed one, which means he's the Messiah, Messiah. the anointed one. And there should be one shepherd over, shepherd over them all, so that they shall live by my statutes and carefully observe my decrees. Obser living by my statutes and carefully observing my decrees, the law of the Lord. They shall live on the land which I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where their fathers lived. They shall live on it forever. Okay, so they're going to get the land. There's this idea of getting land. And I'm, I'm planning little time bombs in your minds, little ticking time bombs that are going to explode in just a little bit. Okay. I will make with them a covenant of peace. I'm going to make with them a covenant. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will multiply them and put my sanctuary among them forever. What's the sanctuary? The temple. <laughs> I'm going to put the temple among them forever. So there's going to be a return to the land, a rebuilding of the temple, the Messiah, a reunification. A reunification. And under Herod the Great, it looked like this was about to happen right before Jesus came. You had Herod the Great. You know, he was, yes, he was an Edomite. But, you know, he, he claimed to have some sort of royal privileges, you know, from the Hasmonean dynasty. Uh, he, God bless you. Um, and he, you know, he had rebuilt the temple. The temple was getting bigger and bigger and better and better. And, and you know, sociopolitically, everything was going great. I mean, there was, there was pract you know, practically speaking, it looked like these promises were being fulfilled. You're having, everybody's coming, is flocking to Jerusalem, you know. It almost looks like, but... So, Things just aren't quite right because he doesn't have a Davidic genealogy. Hmm, so that doesn't quite match the prophets. And you're missing some tribes. You only really have three, you know, two of these tribes plus the Levites, but not the other ten. So something's. Let's turn to Isaiah 52. Again, this is the same theme, another prophet, same theme but looking at it from a different perspective. Isaiah 52. Okay, we were just in Ezekiel 37. And now we're in Isaiah 52, starting with verse 1. Isaiah 52, verse 1. I dare you guys to read the gospel in the same way that you had before this study. <laughs> okay, Isaiah 52, verse 1. Isaiah 52 is part of an ongoing narrative that started at Isaiah 40. And there's a, basically there's, a, there's the idea of the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord. And the servant of the Lord is going to carry out the Lord's purposes. And he's never explicitly called the Messiah in Isaiah. In fact, the only person Isaiah explicitly calls Messiah is Cyrus, the Persian king. But we will see that, I, that Isaiah, even though he doesn't call the servant the Messiah, we will see that he does refer to him as a Messiah, and we'll see why in just a moment. But like back in Isaiah 49, and don't flip there, I'm just going to, you can write this down, Isaiah 49, verse uh, 5 and 6, you know, he basically is talking about, he says that, uh, it is too little, he says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Okay, so there's an idea that the servant will be a light to the nations. And he's going to restore the survivors. Okay, Isaiah 52. Again, this is part of a bigger narrative, and you guys should read all this together. Awake, awake. Isaiah 52, verse 1. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your glorious garments, O Jerusalem, holy city. No longer shall the uncircumcised or the unclean enter you. 
Meaning, you know, when the Gentiles conquer Jerusalem, the Gentiles are the unclean, you know, the oppressors. So he's basically saying, no longer will you have oppressors entering you, but you're going to be basically, you're going to be free. And why Zion? What is Zion? Yeah, Jerusalem. Zion and Jerusalem are interchangeable terms because Zion is the hill in Jerusalem, the mount, where the temple is built. Both Jerusalem and Rome are, can, have seven prominent hills in them. Seven prominent hills. And, and so uh, in Jerusalem, one of those hills is Mount Zion, and that's where the temple is built. And so Jerusalem will often be referred to as Zion for that reason. Okay, verse 2. Shake off the dust, ascend to the throne, Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter Zion. Okay, so there's going to be a taking off your shackles, loose the bonds, and you're going to be enthroned. You were sold for nothing, and without money you shall be redeemed. Does that remind you guys of a New Testament passage? St. Peter says, you were not redeemed with gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, Peter was most probably alluding here to this famous oracle from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord God, to Egypt, in the beginning my people went down to sojourn there. Oh, it's another ref reference to the Exodus. Assyria too oppressed them for naught. So Assyria is going to be like Egypt. You know, Egypt took the people down and there was an Exodus, so Assyria oppressed them. But now what am I to do here, says the Lord? My people have been taken away without redress. The rulers make a boast of it, says the Lord. All the day my name is constantly reviled. Therefore, on that day, my people shall know my renown, that it is I who have foretold it. Here I am. And then here's a famous passage quoted by, Ro by Paul in Romans 10, 15. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings... Gospel, gospel, glad tidings, good news, gospel. Okay, this is an Old Testament term. It's a loaded term. So when Jesus says gospel, people are going, D -d 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 Isaiah 52. You know, this is what people are thinking. This is in the back of their mind. In the same way, if I were to say, I have a dream, <laughs> you know, you people would be like, oh, Martin Luther. Yeah, Martin Luther King Jr., not the other Martin Luther. Okay, I just lost my train of thought. That was, that was really weird. Barbara here, she's laughing really hard. She, she turns red for me. It, it makes me know that I'm funny because I know that I'm funny whenever Barbara, she's like my meter. She, she kind of, you know. You know how they have those meters in basketball stadiums and they, you know, they're how loud can you get? Well, I have my funny meter here. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings glad tidings, announcing peace, bearing good news. Again, there's good news. Announcing salvation and saying to Zion, your God is king. What's the gospel? Your God is king. When the Messiah comes, when God is made king through the Messiah, he elevates his Messiah and his Messiah takes the throne, that's the gospel, guys. That's the gospel. The gospel, according to Paul and according to the New Testament authors, and, and, because they got it from Isaiah, is not, believe it or not, a timeless system of salvation. Like the gospel is the four spiritual laws. You know, and, and so you know, we're, we're, you know, we sinned, and God has a perfect plan for us, and so uh, he needs for you to repent, and then when you repent, you'll be saved. That, yes, that's true. That's all very true. But Paul would not have called that the gospel. Okay? The gospel was a specific term that meant the reign of God. The reign of God through the Messiah. And then that reign entails redemption and restoration and forgiveness of sins. So the gospel effects has the effect of salvation. But the gospel itself means your God is king. Hark. This is very important. Verse 8. Hark, your watchmen raise a cry. Together they shout for joy. For they see directly before their eyes the Lord 
restoring Zion. Okay? This is the theme of restoration. Restoration, the restoration of, of Zion. The bringing back together and restoring the kingdom of David. Break out together in song, O ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord comforts his people. He redeems Jerusalem. Redemption. See, redemption and restoration are tied up with one another. When the Lord redeems, he restores Zion, restores Jerusalem, restores the kingdom. When he restores the kingdom, he's bringing redemption, forgiveness of sins. And this is the gospel. And then, it, and then, that's Isaiah 52. Guess what Isaiah 53 is? We read it every Good Friday in the Good Friday liturgy. Yeah, the suffering servant. He surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. Through his, servant, my, through his suffering, my servant shall justify many. It was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. He was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Okay, that's, that's the suffering servant. So the servant is tied up with the gospel. Tied up with the gospel. Now, in the first century, there were those Jews who were expecting a, a Solomonic or a Davidic kingdom just like what Solomon had. Military might, lots of wealth, lots of camels, nations coming, Israel being over everybody else. But they weren't getting the prophet's message that this Messiah was not going to be like that. This Messiah was going to be a suffering servant. A priest who suffers and who, and who will take away the sin somehow through this redemptive suffering. Let's turn to the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. If we really want to get to the heart of what Jesus taught, we should, we, the Sermon on the Mount is it. I mean, if I had to pick uh, a summary of what Jesus taught, I'd want to choose the Sermon on the Mount. This is, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5 through 7. Excuse me. And after tonight, you guys should be able to say, where is the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5 through 7. Wow, that was really loud. Okay, Matthew 5 through 7. So that you can always go there. And the Sermon on the Mount is an awesome thing to meditate over and to pray over. Really awesome. Why do we call it the Sermon on the Mount? Because in Matthew 5, 1, it says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. He went up the mountain. Now, in this area where he was, there are no mountains per se. There's no... Uh, you know, Mount Tabor, or Mount Nebo, or Mount, you know, like down in the Sinai wilderness, Mount Sinai. There's no mountains. In fact, in Luke's gospel, it says that he gives this discourse on a plain, on a flat area. Well, Matthew is nuancing. He's telling the story from a certain perspective so that we get an Old Testament reference. Matthew uses other language in his gospel, and I'm not going to go through it right now, to show that Jesus is a new Moses. That what happened to Moses happens to Jesus. Moses escaped the massacre of the innocents. Jesus escapes the massacre of the innocents. Moses goes through the Red Sea. Jesus goes through the waters of baptism. There's this correspondence between Moses and Jesus. And so he goes up the mountain like Moses did, and it says that Jesus sat down. Oh man, it feels good. Back then, it was a rabbinic tradition that you would teach sitting down. This is how teachers taught. So you, would, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't teach standing up. You teach sitting down. Did you guys know that it's actually in the liturgical rubrics for the Mass that when the bishop preaches the homily, he can sit down to preach the homily? And it's, not, and it's not put in there just because some bishops were like, man, you know, we need a break. I think we're going to put this, this allowance in the rubrics of the liturgy. No. It goes back to Jewish custom that sitting down is a sign of teaching and of authority. So sometimes bishops will sit and will teach like this. And so when it says that Jesus sat down, Matthew is not just saying, oh, you know, he sat down. This is a great interesting. No, he's, he's sparing no words. He, he means something. He's saying that Jesus is teaching. 
He's, he's assuming a role of teacher. Let's turn to the end of the Sermon on the Mount real quick. Matthew 7, verse 28. Matthew 7, verse 28. When Jesus finished these words, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. See, the scribes would go, Moses was the man. He wrote the Torah. And you know, that's incredible. And you know, this is what I think about that. And you, you know, you can follow me, you can, you can, you know, join my school of thought, you can, you know, study the Torah like me, but the Torah, that's, that's enshrined, that's sacred, you don't touch it. And here's Jesus going, oh, you, you heard that it was said, but I say to you. And you, you heard that it was said, but I say to you. And I forgot where I read this or heard this, but there was a Jewish uh, scholar once who was commenting on the Sermon on the Mount And he said that, you know, any good Jew in Jesus' day would look at Jesus and would say, who do you think you are, God? (laughs) Yeah. 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 So let's turn to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It begins uh, with the eight Beatitudes. And let's, I'm just going to look at the first two Beatitudes this morning. I've, or this evening. Good grief, I'm... My timetable is totally whacked. Yeah, long day, no right, no kidding. These twelve-hour days. So, the uh, I used to be really confounded by the Beatitudes. He begins with, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom, kingdom of heaven." Again, here's this kingdom theme, and Matthew, Matthew, out of all the Gospels, stresses the kingdom the most. The mo- yes. Is there a difference between the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven? No, it's the same. Uh, it's in Matthew's gospel where Matthew says the kingdom of heaven, whereas the other gospels say the Matthew of God. And one opinion why this happens is that uh, he's trying to, to continually emphasize that this kingdom is not of this earth, like Solomon's kingdom. It's going to be. It's going to take a different. It's going to be different in essence. It's going to be heavenly. It's not going to be earthly in the sense that you're going to have military might and the wealth of all the nations. But it's going to be a different type of kingdom. And so that's why Matthew is stressing this, the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. So, but I used to wonder, like, the blessed are the poor in spirit, okay? So I'm supposed to be poor in spirit. I'm supposed to kind of be like Eeyore, you know? (laughs) Uh, Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Okay, so I'm supposed to be like Eeyore, and I'm supposed to go around weeping, and that way I'll be blessed, you know? Is this, I thought Christ came to, you know, make our joy complete and to give us his joy. He says this elsewhere. So what's going on here? What's going on here? Well, let's turn to the Old Testament. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63. By the way, what did Eeyore say? Do you guys remember his famous phrase? Say, nobody cares. I'm... No... No, but oh bother, oh bother. Oh, that's poo. But he did say something. He did. It was like it was like you know nobody cares. I'm just okay. Isaiah sixty. Did I say? Oh, Isaiah sixty one. I apologize. I knew it was an odd number somewhere in Isaiah. Isaiah sixty one. Do you guys remember back in Luke chapter four? Luke chapter four begins with Jesus sitting down or going to the synagogue in his hometown in Nazareth. He goes to the synagogue and they hand him a a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, And he reads from where? Isaiah 61 verses one through two. And then Jesus says, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And then he sat back down, and everybody's like, whoa, whoa, what do you mean it's fulfilled? Who do you think you are? Well, let's see. Remember how I said that Isaiah uh, calls Cyrus the Messiah? Well, let's look about at the servant figure. Let's see what he says about him. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. So while Isaiah doesn't call, explicitly call this person the Messiah, he does say he's being anointed, which means he's the Messiah. Messiah. 
right? So the servant is none other than the Messiah. The servant is not some other person. He's this righteous shrewd of David that Ezekiel and Jeremiah have been talking about. He has sent me to bring glad tidings, that gospel word again, to the lowly to heal the brokenhearted. Mm, you are the, broken, the poor in spirit, the brokenhearted. It's the same concept. To proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. To announce a year of favor from the Lord in a day of vindication. What is this? What Old Testament event is he talking about? Where you have a release of the captives, um, liberty to captives, release to prisoners, a year of favor. The Jubilee. Yeah, in 2000, Pope John Paul II and, you know, celebrated the Jubilee. And he asked for more wealthy nations to relieve the debts of the poorer nations. This is what the Pope called for in the year 2000. The Jubilee. Let's remember that, that when Jesus said this is being filled among you, it's kind of like a new jubilee in a certain sense. This is going to be important. Hang on to that. Verse 2, to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn. That's the second beatitude. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. These are allusions, references to that very same place where Jesus grabbed the scroll from the prophet Isaiah and, and read from when he read, in the prophet, when he read in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. Okay, so the Beatitudes are, yes, about us, but they also point back to who Jesus is. If we're the ones who are blessed because we're poor in spirit and we mourn, then that means that Jesus is the, the Messiah, the anointed one whom uh, Isaiah just talks about here. Okay, let's go back to the, the Sermon on the Mount. So we have these wonderful Beatitudes, and they're all, I mean, there's so much rich Old Testament imagery, I'm not going to get into all of them. But let's look at verse 14 of Matthew 5. He's talking about us, okay? He's talking about the, his disciples. He says, you are the light of the world. Remember that, that I read from Isaiah 49, it said, you are to be a light to the nations, the servant, well, he's saying you are to be a light of the world, and that's Lumen Gentium. One of the documents of the Second Vatican Council was named that, Light of the World, Lumen Gentium, Light of the Nations. And that's the document on the church, the Second Vatican Council, the dogmatic constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium. It takes, it takes it from Isaiah 49 and Matthew 5.14, it's a Latin version. You are the light of the world. A city set on a mountain cannot be hidden. What city set on a mountain cannot be hidden? Jerusalem. Yeah, we're talking about the kingdom, the city. So in the new covenant, where's the city? Where's Jerusalem? Where's the Jerusalem restored? Where's, where's the city? Remember, it's not like Solomon's kingdom where if you're going to have a physical city, but the city are the believers. Zion is restored. <laughs> Meaning that those people who enter Jesus' kingdom are the city. They're the city set on a hill that cannot be hid. So the new, Paul calls the church the Jerusalem from above. The book of Revelation calls the church Jerusalem. Okay, the church is the new Jerusalem. And you know, Moses went up a mountain, and what did he get on top of the mountain? The Ten Commandments, but not just the Ten Commandments. He also got the law. And so here's Jesus going up a mountain. He sits down. He's giving the new law. The new law. How, what he expects of his disciples. How, you know, in the old covenant, you know, you kept the commandments and the decrees. Well, we saw in Ezekiel that there'd be a keeping of the statutes and the decrees. And we have Jesus saying in verse 17, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. By the way, the law or the prophets, that means all the Old Testament. That's how they divided it. Do not think I have come to abolish the Old Testament, but to fulfill. It's a word that means to make complete. Amen, amen, I say to you, amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, the iota, will pass from the law until all things have taken place. And St. Thomas Aquinas, 
who wrote his Summa Theologiae, or Summa Theologica. We call it the Summa. It's like a summary. In fact, the Summa Theologiae was what the, his students were supposed to read before they took his classes. If you guys ever read the Summa, it's difficult reading. But in the Summa, in the uh, Prima Secunda part, the first part of the second part, because the second part is two parts. So you had the first part, the Prima part, then you had the Prima Secunda part, and then the Secunda Secunda part, the, the first part of the second part, and then the second part of the second part. Then he couldn't fit, you know, he died before he finished it, so his students uh, wrote the Tertia part, the third part. So in the Prima Secunda part, the first part of the second part, you have, uh, he talks about law and grace. And he talks about how Jesus fulfilled the law. He, you know, he says that he came to fulfill and not to abolish. And this is how he fulfilled. Uh, the law could be, could be divided. You know, the Jews didn't really divide the law. They didn't really divide it up. They saw it as one big package. That was, but it can be divided into three different categories. Uh, you have the moral aspects. You know, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Seems pretty simple. Everybody can keep that. The Gentiles can keep that part. This is why Paul says that even the Gentiles have the law written upon their hearts in Romans. Okay? There's the moral aspects. Secondly, there are the ceremonial aspects. You know, all the sacrifices the, that we saw last, last week uh, with the wedding of Cana. We saw Numbers 19, which is part of the law. It's part of the Torah. We saw the purification uh, rituals. And then thirdly, we have the moral ceremonial, and thirdly, we have the juridical or the judicial aspects. And those are the, that, uh, that's justice. That determines equity between men and between men with God. Now, I want for you guys to note that the law, the Mosaic law, was not a means by which an Israelite gets to heaven. That's not what they thought about it at all. That was not what the Mosaic law, the Mosaic law was not a means by which an Israelite got to heaven. But it was the means by which an Israelite kept covenant with God, kept covenant with God, you know, kept the covenant. But it was mainly, really, pretty much the positive law of the state. You know, we have this today. Don't speed. Don't steal. It was the, it was the, the law that governed them as a, as a nation. Okay, the positive law of the state, or you could say of the nation. And so these laws, basically, if you kept them, you were being a good citizen. You were being a good citizen, a good Israelite. And so the, the judicial aspects are like, you know, if you kill someone's heifer, you know, make sure you make restitution, you know, for equity. Well, St. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa uh, talks about how Jesus fulfills these different aspects of the law. He fulfills the, the moral by getting to the heart of it. He doesn't say, you know, just don't kill. Just make sure you don't kill anybody. But he says, don't even be angry with one another. And I say, if you're angry with your brother, if you harbor that anger, you know, if you have a passing feeling of anger, that's not sin. Because you, your will is not doing anything. You only sin with your will. But we have disordered passions because of the fall. So you're moved towards something, but if you don't act upon it, it's not sin. Because you're not willing it. But Jesus says, you know, if you, if you harbor this anger, if you're angry with your brother, you're liable to judgment. So he gets to the heart of it. He says, you know, don't just not commit adultery, but if you lust after another woman, you've already committed adultery with her in the heart. He gets to the heart of it. And Jesus himself perfectly fulfills the moral because he's sinless. And he commands his followers to be more than just good citizens... He wants them to be saints. Not just good citizens, but to be saints. And you can look to Daniel chapter 7. I believe it might be verse 14, but it's in Daniel 7 where it talks about how this, the son of man, when he gets his kingship, so the saints will reign with him. The saints of the, the, saints of the Most High. You have the ceremonial aspects. Jesus is both priest and victim. He's the sacrifice for our sin. And Jesus commands us to sacrifice, not sheep, not goats, not cattle, but to sacrifice ourselves. St. Paul says in Romans 12, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, acceptable worship to the Lord. There's the judicial aspects. 
Jesus came to restore equity between us and God. We have a debt towards God that we cannot pay, yet we must. Jesus has no debt with God. He need not pay any debt, but he can pay our debt. So he, he brings about righteous equity between us and God. And he also restores equity between us. He restores relationships. He restores Zion. He brings his, his people together to where they live such a, uh, a, uh, a profound communion. And we, you see this lived out in the life of the early church in, in Acts of the Apostles, uh, chapter 2, verse 42, where they shared all things in common and broke bread and uh, devoted themselves to the prayers and the apostles' teaching. There's this communal aspect where he, where he takes care of us. So the, the judicial, we can call this uh, uh, justification, where he makes us right with the Father. So Jesus comes to fulfill the law. He does away with the juridical aspects. You no longer need this constitution. We, we now have, we have a positive law in the church. It's called canon law. It can and will change. Okay, it's, it's changeable. But it, the juridical aspects are done away with because you don't, well, actually the whole law you don't have to keep per se because it's all one big thing. You have the ceremonial, so we no longer have to do animal sacrifice and stuff. But the moral aspect is not just pertains to the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law reflects the, the moral aspect. And Paul again says that the Gentiles have this upon their hearts. So let's look at what Jesus says. Um, in Starting in verse 21, Jesus gives what is popularly known as the six antitheses. The six antitheses. And this is where he says, you heard it was said, but I say to you. And it was also said, but I say to you. The six antitheses. Where Jesus calls us to be not just good citizens, but he wants us to be saints. And so St. Augustine said, St. Augustine said that the law was given, the law was given that grace might be sought. Okay, because the Israelites found out they couldn't keep even being good citizens, they couldn't keep that. So the law was given so that grace might be sought, so that they might ask for God's help, so they might realize their sinfulness. Grace, the law was given so that grace might be sought, and grace was given so that the law might be kept. And so what he means is that, not that we keep the ceremonial aspects or that we keep the judicial aspects. Uh, we do in a certain sense where we live self-sacrificial lives and we live in communion with one another. We love one another, but also morally, grace gives us the ability to be saints. We have this new ability, and we call this the new law, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And St. Paul in Romans chapter 8 talks about this new power, that those who are given grace, who have the power of grace, are no longer bound to the law, because you can go far beyond the law. Not because you're good in and of yourself, not because you're really good people, but because you rely upon the grace and the mercy of Christ. And because you rely upon him to help you. Not because you are somehow intrinsically holy and you can do this on your own. No, it's because of the grace of God. The six antitheses, the first one is anger. And, we, and I just talked about that. Anger. The second antithesis is adultery. Adultery. Did you guys know, and this is important to note, I, I just want to note this real quick, because sometimes there's confusion, moral confusion, with regard to these things. Yes, anger is a sin. Anger is a sin. So, uh, not the feeling that rises up within you, you know, concupiscence, but when you act upon it, when you feed it, when you, so don't just let your anger out. No, that's sinful, guys. Psychologists today who say it's healthy just to let your anger out, just let it rip. No, your anger, anger will increase, and it's sinful to do that. Okay? And, but there is such a thing, anger can actually be a virtue. Righteous anger. You know, I'm upset that, guys, every single day in this country, more people die than have died in the entire Iraqi war. Well, U.S. soldiers. More people died today in America through abortion 
than have occurred in the whole Iraqi war. More people died today in abortion than occurred when the Twin Towers were hit. About 3,000 were killed then, a little bit over 3,000. 4,000 every... I am upset, guys. I am angry. Not to the point where I'm going to go bomb clinics. Now, that would be sinful, but I have a righteous anger, and that's okay. That's good. That's the virtue of justice being born forth in your heart. Adultery. You, adultery is basically lust. It's treating one another as an object. And so lust can occur within marriage. You can actually be lustful towards your spouse. You can look at your spouse as an object, and you can treat them as an object. And you cannot love them for, with a self-sacrificial type of love. And so chastity, chastity is loving, truly loving. And so chastity is, is not just for those virgins out there, but it's for married people to live out. You know, so that when you love one another, you do it with a clean and a pure heart, not just because you want to get some. <laughs> Seriously. And so we have to guard ourselves from lust even within marriage. It's an important aspect of marriage preparation. And we also see what happens if your eye, let's look at your eye here. Uh, it says... He says, if you're right, verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into Gehenna, which was the, the valley of Hinnom, the big garbage dump. It's a figure Jesus uses to teach about hell. Does he mean that he actually wants for you guys to rip out your eyes and throw them away? Yes and no. No, not literally, but literarily. He's saying that mortal sin, guys, is so bad that you should take extreme measures to get away from it, to get away from this type of sin. Take extreme measures. If you have pornography on your computer, if you can't get away from it, throw away your computer. Guys, it's okay. You'll live without one, but you'll save your soul. Okay, he's speaking with hyperbole. Hyperbole. Okay, we have the teaching about divorce. Because, divor because marriage is a covenant... And you can look at Matthew 19, where, where Matthew gives the extended discourse of Jesus on divorce and remarriage. Matthew 19, he says, It was also said, it was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for porneia, and that's, that's called the porneia exception clause, and that's a whole other subject. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for Pernea, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So we have the teaching about divorce. We have the teaching about oaths. What have I been teaching you? That we need to swear oaths, right? To enter into the covenant. This is a Hebrew way of thinking. Here's Jesus saying, verse 33, Again you have heard that it was said to your ancestors, Do not take a false oath, but make good to the Lord all that you vow. But I say to you, do not swear at all. Do not swear at all. Not by heaven, for it is God's throne. Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And there you go, you have Jerusalem, the city being talked about. You know, The great king, who is the great king? No, the great king that Jesus is talking about here? David or Solomon. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black. You know, may my hair turn white if I, you know, if I transgress this. You know, that's people. Um, let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more is from the evil one. No kidding, right? What was happening in the day, this is the context, is that people were entering into contracts with one another, but they were, so, they were such scoundrels, they were so untrustworthy, that you couldn't trust them. Their signature wasn't good enough. So they were swearing left and right. I swear by the temple. I swear by the hair on my head. I swear by the earth. I swear by the heavens. I swear by this and that. And, and people were just swearing. Guys, what's the commandment? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. This is primarily directed towards oath swearing. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. And Jesus is saying in contractual relationships, don't ever swear. It's so sacred. Do not swear at all in contracts. Do not go to Walmart and say, I swear that I will pay this credit card bill. No, let your yes mean yes. 
Let, let your signature be good enough. Be an honest, trustworthy person. Down to the core, be a saint. And again, he's using hyperbole. This does not mean don't swear at all, because somehow swearing is intrinsically sinful. No, this would negate the entire, the entire nature of a covenant. It also negates uh, Hebrews chapter 6, where it talks about God swearing an oath. You know? Plus, he institutes the oath of baptism. We're recalling upon the name of the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're, you know, uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 10, he says, whoever, uh, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's an oath action. This is oath terminology. Teaching about retaliation. So we've had anger, adultery, and divorce. That's three. O's, that's four. You have retaliation, and we have love of enemies. But, you know, I really, those are kind of difficult teachings to follow, so I'm just going to skip over those. I'm just going to skip over those. Those are, I mean, those, that's, that's a good thing. I'll read that sometime later in the future. And then we have, uh, Jesus reaffirms the act of penance. He does not do away with penance. But he gives the classical threefold form of penance. Penance, classically, could be divided into prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And notice that penance has a positive aspect. It's not just, you know, bad and doing away with things and just fasting. But it's praying. It's having a relationship with the Lord. Okay, praying is considered penance. Of course, there's fasting, which is, has a negative connotation, but you're doing it for, you give up a good thing for a, an even greater thing, God himself. Give up the good, give up the gift for the giver. Prayer, fasting, and then almsgiving. Again, almsgiving is a positive aspect. Charity, love of neighbor. So we have prayer, fasting, and almsgiving that Jesus deepens the aspects. He says, don't be a hypocrite. Don't pray, you know, uh, with many lengthy prayers out where people can see you, but shut your door where your heavenly Father can hear you. And don't, you know, walk around and go, oh, guys, I've been fasting all day long. It's horrible. Oh. But put on your makeup. Anoint your head. And when you give alms, don't be like, hey, guys, you know, look it. I'm giving you this. But, you know, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And right in the middle, he starts off with almsgiving, talks about prayer, then he talks about fasting, but let's look at the prayer aspect. He gives us the Our Father, and we're going to do this so fast, your, your heads are going to be spinning. The Our Father. Remember how we were talking, we got back to these prophets, and we looked at Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 37, and Isaiah 52, and we saw the New Exodus theme? The Our Father follows this New Exodus theme, because each petition of the Our Father is an Old Testament theme in and of itself. How does the Our Father begin? Our Father. It was not common for Israelites to pray Our Father or to, or to invoke God as Father. And this is why when Jesus goes around calling God Father and styling himself as the Son of God, everybody's like, hey, what are you doing? This is a Christian thing. This is not an Israelite thing. But rather, calling upon God and Father only happens in, in specific instances in the Old Testament. And uh, let me give, I'm gonna, you guys can look at look at these later on, but Isaiah 63, which we just looked at, remember? Well, I'm sorry, we looked at Isaiah 61. But right in that same context of, the, of Isaiah prophesying the new Exodus, we have Isaiah 63, 10 through 17. That's actually called the Our Father of the Old Testament, the Pater Noster, which is Latin for Our Father, the Pater Noster of the Old Testament, because it's constantly calling upon God as Father to act as he did in the Exodus, to bring about a new Exodus. We have Jeremiah, chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, calling upon God as Father, and 31, 7 through 9. These have new Exodus themes. And then Tobit, Tobit 13, 1 through 6. So when Jesus prays our Father, he's, he's invoking this prophetic tradition. And when he says, hallowed be thy name, it's not a declarative statement. Like, you know, your name's hallow. Your, your name's holy. That's a great thing. Your name's holy. It's not a declarative statement like that. He's not just declaring it. Rather, it's an imperative request. It's asking God to do something. It's saying, God, will you please make your name holy now? 
You know, hallow your name is more is the literal connotation. And there's only one place in the Old Testament where, where someone asks for God to make holy his name. And you guys are going to recognize this. Ezekiel 36, 22 through 28. What's Ezekiel 36? It's right there in the restoration, the new exodus, the coming of the Messiah. Okay? And that's hallow, hallow your name. And then your kingdom come. Now there's a lot of talk about kingdom and, you know, and of the kingdom. But the kingdom specifically coming, a request for the kingdom to come, this specific Greek phrase is, is so rare, it's only found in one place in all the Old Testament, just like to hallow your name. And that's in Micah 4 through 8. Micah 4, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, your kingdom come. And again, you'll see the new Exodus theme here. Give us today our what bread? Uh Uh-uh. That's not what the Greek says. The Greek says, give us this day our epiousios. Epiousios bread. Give us this day our epiousios bread. The Council of Nicaea, they said that the son is homoousios with the father. He is homo, the same, ousios, substance or nature as the father. So the, the son is, et- is eternally coexistent with the father. So he's epiousios. Ousios means nature. Ep- epi means super or above. So it's like supernatural or, uh, uh, you know, out of this world type of bread. Give us this. Now where was there a place in the Old Testament where there was supernatural bread given? And it was daily. It was give us this day our bread. And if you kept more than for one day, it would go bad. Because you had to collect it that morning. The manna. The manna when? In the Exodus. The Exodus theme. Okay. Give us this day our epius. And guess where we pray this prayer in the liturgy? Right after the consecration. Give us this day our epiousius bread. Not daily. That's not what it says. <laughs> and even in the catechism, it talks about this. In the catechism, it says this isn't daily. I mean, we've been, it's nowhere else found in all the Bible. It's like this weird word. It's like, it's like saying, you know, I really like you, God. You're great. Transubstantiation. And so blah. It's like, whoa, where'd that come from? You know? So the, uh, it's, a, it's a very odd word. Okay. And then forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When is there a forgiving of debts? A forgiving of the debts? Remember, we just talked about this. The Jubilee. Remember, this is why I said I'm planting time bombs, sticking time bombs in your minds. The Jubilee. And guess what the Jubilee was? If, if you had debts, your land would be taken from you. And you couldn't get to your land. But when your debts were forgiven, you got to go back to your land. Turn to Matthew 5, Matthew 5 verse 5. The third beatitude. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Inheriting the land. Again, there's this, in the prophetic themes, there's the idea of returning to to the land and inheriting the land. And Jesus is kind of picking up this theme when he's talking about, uh, he's giving his beatitudes. Okay. So the Jubilee has a return to the land, and in the Exodus, they basically went to their land. They returned to the land. So there's a, the, our Father has all these Old Testament rich imageries uh, being brought together. And then Jesus gives a commandment against polygamy in chapter 6, verse 24. He says, no man or no one can serve two masters. You guys didn't get that, did you? Yes, we did. No man can serve two, no masters. Can serve two masters. It's a commandment against polygamy. Did you guys? I guess it's getting really late. You guys are just totally out of here. 
You either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You know, he's talking about polygamy here. Jesus says in, ver- in chapter 6, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God. There's this kingdom theme. And his righteousness and all these things will be given you besides. Okay, as we close, let's turn to Mark's gospel. And let's look at the second thing Jesus says. Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Remember, he just said this is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, repent and believe in the gospel. Then he say, passed by the Sea of Galilee. He saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting their nets into the sea. They were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Come after me and I will make you fishers of men. Jeremiah 16, 16. Jeremiah talks about the restoration. And he says specifically that the Lord will send fishers of men. And we already saw how, was, I believe it was in Jeremiah, he talked about how he will point shepherds over them. These are who the apostles are. They're the shepherds. They're the fishers of men. They are the stewards of the Messiah who are going to bring about this restoration, who are going to continue the Messiah's work. Kind of cool, huh? These are the Old Testament themes. Are you guys understanding this? Is this making sense? All right, well, let's close. You guys look really tired. You guys look really beat. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, you are our King, and we are your kingdom. You have delivered us from sin and you have brought us into the unity of your body. You have appointed shepherds over us. You have fed us with manna. You are so good. I ask for the grace this week to be rid of pride in whatever little insidious ways that it crops up. And I ask that you would give me and give the rest of these people here a gift of love so that we may become saints, so that we may love in a way that is profound, a way that is only done by your indwelling spirit. Thank you so much, Lord, for the gift of the spirit. May the Spirit renew us. May we be enlivened and quickened by Him. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.